for this presentation, and then I will ask you to, um, you can unmute later, but for right now, I would ask everyone to mute your audio and video, and uh, we will get started in just a minute. Okay, if, you're muted, if your audio and video is not muted, I will mute it, so uh, have that in mind. So we're going to begin right now. I'm delighted that uh, we are going to ask our new executive director uh, to come forward and to bring greetings. Hi, everyone. I know that there are some of us a little saddened by the idea of, of not being able to be in person, but we're going to keep our fingers crossed for, for next year's birthday. Um, this is something the Historical Society does every year. Believe it or not, 1837 is our, is our birthday, 185 years young. And uh, I just wanted to say hello. I know we have to move the program along, so I'm going to make my announcements brief. But I wanted to thank all the members that make this program possible and also the business members. Some of you saw their names scrolling at the beginning of the presentation. And uh, it's the membership really and the support we get that makes programs like this possible. I wanted to highlight just a few of the programs coming up. They're all going to be virtual. Um, right around the corner, we have our BLT on Tuesday and uh, Professor Robert Lemieux is going to be talking about icons of American animation and the exhibit at McDaniel College's Rice Gallery. Uh, make sure you register for that if you haven't already. Um, looking into February, we have our very own Marianne Ashcraft, who's going to talk about African-American carvers and creating memorials. And that is a perfect presentation in line as we celebrate African-American History Month in February. And then many of you know about our virtual winter wine tasting event under the Tuscan sun with Bernie Vogel who's the owner of Jeannie Bird Baking Company. And that's always a fun event. All of these things you can see online by visiting our events tab, calendar events, and it's pretty easy to sign up for. And then before I pass the virtual mic over to Dr. Jim Leitner, I wanted to say thank you to Lynn Wheeler and the programming committee and everyone involved for pivoting, you know, we use that word a lot now, and making this event possible virtually. You know, we had it scheduled in person, but to see things come together so quickly is really inspiring. And so I just wanna thank everybody that was involved. I'm happy to be the new executive director of the Historical Society and meet you all in person at a later date. And with that, I believe I'm passing it over to Dr. Jim Leitner. Thank you, Jason. We are pleased to have as our speaker this afternoon, Diana Scott. Diana was born in Baltimore County, but has been a long time resident of Carroll County with her husband, George, Charles, for over 50 years in the Eldersburg area, and more recently at Carroll Lutheran Village. She's one of my neighbors. Mrs. Scott had a variety of positions in the county, including being a correspondent for the Carroll County Evening Sun, a community relations specialist at Carroll Community College, and as an intern with the Carroll County Tourism Office, where she created two walking tours of Westminster. Since 1976, almost 50 years, she has also been a very loyal volunteer here at the Historical Society in a variety of roles. Our speaker completed degrees at Carroll Community College, Towson University and McDaniel College. Her research in history has been published in several books, including her master's thesis on the Liberty Reservoir called The Forgotten Corner, A History of Oakland Mill, published by the HSCC, which of course is the subject of today's talk. We thank her for sharing this story with us this afternoon. Well, thank you, Jim. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, 
the Forgotten Corner. When they were trying to find a buyer for the Oakland Mill in 1914, they described it as a little world unto itself where people looked out for one another. It sounds like a nice place to live, doesn't it? And a place that you might not want to leave. I wanted to show you the corner that I'm talking about. It's in the lower right-hand corner of Carroll County, southeast. This is it, the same corner, but expanded. So this is Baltimore County today and Howard County. But in the 1700s, this area was included in Baltimore County. As a matter of fact, where present day Route 27 is, somewhere in this neighborhood, uh, everything on the eastern side was Baltimore County. It expanded all the way up to Cecil County, and it also went all the way down to the harbor. Now, on the other side of Route 27 was Frederick County, and it went all the way up to Garrett. So it was, they were quite large, these counties. Now we have two rivers, actually. It's the branches of one river, the Patapsco. This is the North Branch, and this is the South Branch coming in. They met and became one as they moved towards the harbor of Baltimore and right around Brooklyn and uh, Cherry Hill is where it goes into the harbor. Now you might wonder why all this is so dark. This map was made after Liberty Reservoir was built and it shows the flooding of it. Uh, this is Morgan Run, a tributary that has fed the uh, North Branch forever. And then this is the Piney Run tributary. This is the North Branch coming down and right here is Liberty Dam. The dam is um, near Marriott'sville. Now in the corner here is the Melville Woolen Mill, which I'm about to tell you a lot about. And it's in the water now. Now, if we go this way, we will find ourselves on Liberty Road. Liberty Road um, became known as that around 1776 for some reason. And then uh, it was earlier Diggs Wagon Road, 1749. The land between the two branches of the river was called the Forks. So if you were a settler back then, you, you said that you were from the Forks. I'll take note of this is where Eldersburg is today, and this is where Sykesville is, uh, all the way down on the, the uh, South Branch. <clears throat> oh, my, my, my. Okay, sorry about that. <clears throat> so here's another close up of the area that I just showed you, but this is even closer. Here we are on Route 26, Liberty Road, crossing the Liberty Reservoir. The people who live there, and I was one of them um, for the last 55 years, we called it Liberty Lake. At any rate, if you're coming across from Baltimore County on Liberty Road, you go to the top of the hill and you see a, you see a traffic light and over it you'll see uh, Oakland Mills Road. As you go down Oakland Mills Road to the right, you will see the Boat Dock Road. And this was Miss Meadows, um, one of my informants. Uh, it was her farm, her parents' farm. I talked to about eight women and two men who told me what they could remember about Oakland. You continue down Oakland Mills Road until you 
see a church. This is the old church, 1849, thereabouts. You make a right-hand turn and you continue all the way to the end. And of course, the Oakland town and the mill were in this area that is now flooded. Now, if you're coming back, you will see Greenville Road. And Greenville was a little hamlet that was also flooded and the majority of it is here under Morgan Run, actually, that is. And the people who lived there did not, they worked at the mill, but they owned their own houses. And the same thing on Oakland Road, there were a few houses here that the people owned themselves, but they also worked at the mill. And a little bit farther on, right here, is where my house was. I say was because it was just two years ago that I did move to Carroll Lutheran Village and became neighbors with Jim. <laughs> and so now we go down and out once more. And just because this is Branton Manor on Old Liberty Road, it's the oldest house on Liberty Road, 1766. In um, <clears throat> a 1798 book, um, a 1798 map in my book reveals that there were many members of the Bennett family uh, who were living in the area that would become Oakland. Thomas Bennett was the first one to patent, uh, it was called Bennett's Park. And a little bit later on, he also patented White Oak Bottom. Perhaps that's where the oak comes from, the name Oak. Uh, Elisha Bennett eventually inherited it along with a, another Bennett named Jesse. But Elisha was the one who was the first entrepreneur. Uh, he went away from the farming and decided that he would do uh, milling. He built what you see in front of us, uh, a grist mill. And this was 1813. <clears throat> In 1826, 13 years later, uh, the mill was leased to a father and son duo by the name of Samuel Morton. They were also junior and senior. The Mortons hailed from Germany and until they became naturalized citizens, they could not own any property. Finally, in 1834, they did become naturalized and they converted this grist mill into a cotton mill. Now then, a man from Baltimore by the name of William D. Miller bought the cotton mill in 1844. He stayed partners with Mr. Miller, I mean, with Mr. Morton. And they called it the Oakland Manufacturing Company. And this was the first time that the word Oakland was used. Mr. Miller um, changed the name, and I'm assuming this happened after Mr. Morton uh, left him or passed away uh, into the W. Miller Manufacturing Company of Baltimore. After that, it was Arsimus Schofield who became partners with Mr. Miller. He was the son of an Oella textile worker, um, worker. And he had the dubious distinction of having the first fire it was during the Civil War, 1862. The Southerners put flint in the bales of cotton that they were shipping to the mill. And once the flint made contact with the machinery, it created sparks which ignited all the cotton and destroyed the interior of the mill. You might be surprised to learn that the next owner of the mill was none other than Enoch Pratt of library fame. It really surprised me. Uh, he bought the mill in 1867 and he rebuilt it and changed it into a woolen mill. He also hired the first of the Melville clan, John Graham Melville and William Miller ran the mill for Mr. Pratt. Now this is the first 1877 was the first time that Oakland 
the word Oakland appeared on a map for the first time. It had been called it, but it was it hadn't appeared on a map. The town had a town had grown up around Oakland, um, and here is the town um, from the late 1800s. A house, the Melville House, was located in the trees. This was a large, long barn that had been used as a text, as a, uh, a dairy at one time. Then this two-story building was their warehouse, which later became a school. And then this was the company store. Above, you will see houses, duplex houses, uh, hugging the hillside of Oakland Road. Mr. Graham Melville, John Graham Melville, he had three sons. And of course they lived in this, well, I might as well show you. Um, they lived in this house, the one that was in the trees on the previous slide. And it was James, John Coulter and Charles. When he left to go to another plant in Virginia, these three sons bought the mill from Enoch Pratt. They only had it for about a year when they defaulted on the mortgage and they couldn't get their creditors to, to uh, hold off. And so the, the mill was taken from them. They did not want to leave. They had grown up in that house. They had grown up in that town and they wanted to be there. However, James took it the hardest and he said he refused to leave. And they called the sheriff and the sheriff came and bodily carried him out of that house. And he eventually he moved to Chicago and made a success out of his life. But it was just a very sad thing for these three men who had grown up in this house and in this town. John Coulter, the second son, he left Oakland to run a mill in Virginia. Perhaps it was the same mill that his father had gone to. Um, <clears throat> he, has a, he had a story that he wanted people to know is that when he was a child, he went all the way to Baltimore to pay the rent to Pratt and the two of them became very good friends. Charles, the youngest, well, actually he was not the youngest son. The youngest son was William but he was kind of out of the picture. He didn't join with his, his brothers in running the mill or in losing the mill either. Charles, the third son, um, decided that after losing the mill that he would become a farmer. And where I showed you Greenville Road, right across from it is a large white house that still stands today. And that was his home and his farm. <clears throat> He decided that uh, farming was fine, but he also tried his hand at politics. In 1919, he became the county commissioner for Carroll County at that point, and he had that job until 1942 at his death. Uh, that was 23 years he was a commissioner. Now, who bought the mill from the three Melville brothers? It was a man named Nicholas Steele, and this was in 1892. And here comes the name change again. He changed it from the Oakland Manufacturing Company of Baltimore to the Oakland Manufacturing Company of Carroll County. He too had bad luck. He had only had it about six months when a terrible fire broke out. And the mill that you saw at the beginning of this presentation, the stone mill, um, once again, the interior burned to the ground. Well, Mr. Steele decided that he was going to do something different. He repaired the old mill, and then he built this five-story mill in the hills of Oakland. He equipped it with the latest fire fighting equipment, and even on the top of a hill to the right, he had a reservoir built. 
Mr. Steele eventually de he defaulted on his mortgage and no doubt it was because of all the cash he put into rebuilding one mill and establishing another. John Coulter Melville, this is the second son who lost, this, lost the mill. Well, you can imagine in 1915, he returns after 23 years away and he must have been with a lot of satisfaction that he bought the town um, once again. John was well loved. He had a very strong work ethic and he never took a vacation. That is a strong work ethic. <laughs> Now, John Coulter, he had uh, four children, three sons and one daughter. One of his sons is this little fellow. This is George, the second son. And I wanted you to take a look at what he's got on. He's got knickers and he has a dress shirt. He has a tie and a baseball cap. So you can tell that uh, he was really wanting to be a baseball player, but apparently his parents made him dress up or maybe it was a Sunday, who knows. His buddy next to him came from Greenville and this little boy was named Stuart Vaughn and he has a baseball uh, outfit on and a Scottish low socks. And he too has the baseball hat, but it looks very similar to his buddies. So perhaps they were on the same team. Baseball was big in Oakland. This is George's house as he, when he grew older. And across the street and down this hill a little bit was the company store, which George ran oh, for several years before he finally left the town of Oakland, moved to New York City and uh, handled the sales for the company there. The oldest son that I bypassed telling you about George, his name was John Graham. And he was just the nicest soul that anybody could meet. He became the president of the company. And like his father, he was really quite friendly. People could say to him, hi, Graham. He, he never, the Mr. Mr. Melville was always Graham. And he would don his overalls, get down on the mill floor, and fix any of the machinery that might have been broken or help somebody else to do it. He lived in a beautiful Dutch colonial house. And this was at um, the top of, it was out of town. And I saw it as a person who moved there in 1965. It was a beautiful house, uh, but they tore it down. Uh, the man who, was tearing it down, I, was, I had talked to, and he said it was pitiful because there were gorgeous floors, gorgeous architectural features on the interior, uh, just a lovely place. The third son was Tom. Tom was a different sort. He was very stern. Um, people said that when he came into the mill, that everybody, and listen at this one, stumped out their cigarettes and looked very busy so that he would know that they were working. But it just seemed like um, a woolen mill was perhaps not the best place to have a cigarette at any rate. Um, he, he owned a beautiful home on the hillside and it was called Blueberry Hill. Now, when I was growing up and I lived in Woodlawn at the time, um, many of us traveled up to Blueberry Hill. Um, we were watching the submarine races from the top of Tom's property. What? Tom was a college educated man and he was an accomplished pianist. And he did all the I know what that means. The now there was one child left and this was Edith and she was not an active partner. She had married in Oakland and the ladies that I interviewed 
were thrilled that she had done that. There was a beautiful wedding, apparently. She married Marion Patrick, a Naval Academy graduate. And then he became a banker in Uruguay and Chile. So they moved there while he was doing his banking. Eventually, they moved to Florida. And she died at 86. And he died 10, year, 10 days later at 87. So I just thought it was a quite a love story. This is a picture of the ladies in the 20s who worked at the mill. They're on their break. Um, in 1896, when Mr. Steele had the mill, they had 225 employees. And the most I ever saw was 333 employees, and that was in 1904. When um, John Coulter came back to reclaim the mill in 1915, it was 150 people and eventually he, they were 200, a little bit over 200 who worked for him. This mill was an economic mainstay of the community. Only Springfield Hospital had more employees from this end of the county. Workers came from the Oakland area, but they also came from as far away as Deer Park and as Gamber. This was quite a walk. So, the Melvilles decided that they would build a boarding house in the town for those who had to make that long walk and did not want to walk again back home again. They worked 10 hours a day, 60 hours a week, so that meant no Saturday off. And they made $8 to $12 a week. And if you made the high end, the $12, you make $48 a month. And $576 a year. They also liked this town to work in because it was so the work was so steady. Uh, the mill hired farmers if they needed help. And the farmers hired the mill operatives during their harvesting and planting times if they needed help. So there seemed always to be work available for people who wanted it. Now take a look at this. This is a duplex house that the Melvilles provided for all their uh, workers. Each side had four rooms, two down, two up. And each one of those rooms cost $1. And if you had a porch, it was, it cost 50 cents. So you could be paying $4.50 for these houses. And there were 60 of these houses by this time. They heated with coal that was brought in from Sykesville. And they also had heated with wood. And then they would heat also with kerosene. They had no running water, but for every four houses, there was a pump house where buckets were filled and brought back to the house. And there's still one of these little pump houses at the end of Oakland Road. They used privies. Uh, farmers did too. As a matter of fact, all the country folks seemed to. Um, no uh, electricity. The Millvilles were very kind. They hired a handyman who kept the village in repair, and they also painted the houses inside and out whenever they needed it. And they also hired somebody to plow a space so that the workers could put their gardens in. And with a family being between four and six children, they really did need a garden. Now this is the back of the, country, of the company store. And on the porch area, you'll see two barrels, uh, the back of, a, of a, the old Coke machine. And down below was a 1920 vintage truck. What you see is a mill race that goes down to the mill. And on the other side, you see the north branch of the Patapsco River. Now, 
I couldn't help but think that if you had to go to the bathroom, this was a long walk to come down all the way, cross this bridge onto, into one of these little uh, privies, which were placed over the North Branch. The Melvilles also had a nice house. They went out during the winter time. They cut the ice from the from the various creeks around. Some, I'm sure, from the some of the ice certainly from the uh, North Branch. They had one <clears throat> phone, and that was in the company store that you're seeing here. So apparently, you didn't have too many secrets when you were in the mill. Um, the Oakland Mill people had a type of medical plan. Uh, money for a doctor was deducted from an employee's salary so that if they became sick, the doctor's fee would be covered. And there was also a blackboard in this company store. And if you were sick or a member of your family was sick, you signed your name on it. And then Dr. Martin from the Randallstown area or Dr. Norris from the Sykesville area would take turns visiting the mill town in their horse and buggy. They would go inside, no doubt, pick up a few things for themselves and their families. Um, they read the names um, to see who was sick and went, went to see them. They charged two or three dollars per visit. For the, for the farmers, they charged a bit more, about four or five dollars probably because they had to go a little bit farther. Here you see Mr. Haight outside of his post office, his traveling post office. Um, this was quite a convenience for the town folk. Mr. Haight made the trip uh, to Oakland each day at six o'clock in the morning. And then he came back to this building in Haight and visited Haight again to pick up more mail, went to Eldersburg, went to Sykesville, and came back again to Haight. And that was 19 mile round trip, 19 mile route. It was a 38 mile round trip. And he did this twice a day. <clears throat> so transportation in Oakland, it was by mule or horse, most often it was by walking. Some people had a bicycle. But this was a real surprise to me to see a lady on a motorbike with her child beside her in the sidecar. But the more I looked at this picture, and especially after um, I could see it in, enlarged, you can see that she's riding side saddle, which would be rather difficult. I, do, I think this was just a photo op. <laughs> but nevertheless, it did show that whoever was selling these was trying to do a good job and sell them to somebody here now that they had concrete roads. And the concrete road, if I didn't say before, was put in in 1917 and trucks were beginning to be used in 1918. The mill was in a very good position for transportation. It was only 15 miles to Baltimore City. It was five miles to Reiserstown, where the Western Maryland Railroad would take uh, the wares that the, the uh, mill produced. And it was only eight miles to Sykesville and the b &O Railroad there. Oakland had no police and had no fire department. I think they should have had a fire department, but nevertheless, um, but they did have their own band and their own baseball team. <clears throat> this, this was important to the town folk. You can see, I counted there, there seems to be 15 members of the band here. Religion. In Oakland, there was a church called the Union Church of Oakland, and it served the entire mill community. All denominations attended here. Education. If you take a look at this, you can count uh, about 30 children here. Um, I saw on the sign 
uh, which they called, uh, what did they call this? A slab. The, it was a black uh, piece of blackboard. And this was 1914, these kids had their picture taken. The teacher, I assumed, was the lady, the outstanding lady in white in the top row, but she also looks like a, a child to me. So who knows who the real teacher was? I'm just going to guess that it was her. In 1865, there was a new state law that went in, and they said that um, all children in the county were entitled to free public schooling. So Carroll County conformed by creating a board of school commissioners to enforce the law. In 1868, a school was opened in the basement of that Union Church that I just told you about. This was a district school, not a town school. So everybody in the surrounding here, anybody could go to the school. And they had slabs, not desks to write upon for about a year or so. So they did not have a desk for a while. There were seven grades. And then the, all the children graduated to Sykesville, where they went to 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th grades. There was no 12th grade until 1950. And then the Union Church and the Oakland School burned to the ground in 1925. Everybody in the community was so upset. Uh, even the, men, the two men that I talked to, everybody knew that date, 1925. It was quite, uh, quite sad for everybody. One of the ladies, Margareta McCoy, uh, she even saved a part of the school bell. It was molted by that time, but she did save it, and I got a chance to see it. Um, here is the town of Oakland, a little bit better than the first one, not better, but bigger than it was the first time around. Um, this, the Millvilles decided that this two-story warehouse would be more suitable as a school. So this was the replacement school for the kids uh, whose, whose place had burned down. Of course, this is the uh, company store right next to it. We have George Melville's house up on the hill. Uh, until this picture was enlarged, I didn't realize that these were two uh, pumps for gasoline. And here you have the new cars that were being brought into town now, but they had uh, a solid concrete road to, to uh, ride on. And this is the community center, and you'll see more about that. The children, the children used this school until 1932. When this beauty was given to them, <laughs> the ladies that I talked to said it was a portable. And Right now, it's on the watershed property at the end of Oakland Road. Uh, it was the last two-room schoolhouse in Carroll County, and it was sold to Baltimore City in 1953 for $2,000. Its tattered remains survive to this day. So you can go and see this, perhaps not with all the weeds in the gutter, but you can, you can go to see this. Um, and, the Baltimore City employees use it as a storehouse and a workshop. Entertainment, what did they do in the 1920s and 30s in a mill town? Well, when the town was built, <clears throat> when the community hall was built, I should say, it was 1925. So I wasn't sure if, and no one else seemed to be either, whether John Coulter Melville built this, this uh, pretty nice uh, community hall because the church and school had burned down or if it was just a coincidence that 1925, this building went up. Upstairs was used for silent movies twice a week. There was a lady named Thelma Shipley who came in and played the piano for them on those two days a week. 
They had a large stage that was used for performances that were put on by the school children and any other people who wanted to do um, a play or a sing-along. And they did have holiday sing-alongs. People love those. And it was also used as a dance hall. Downstairs was a bowling alley. And the bowling alley had a snack bar that sold popcorn, candy, and soda pop. It wasn't just for the mill workers. People came from all over, from Eldersburg, all over the Eldersburg area, uh, even some as far as uh, uh, Sykesville came up to participate in the fun. The mill workers participate in, in parades. One time they did a float. This was in 1937 to celebrate the 100th birthday of Carroll County. And the marching band was in the parade. And often in the town, they had band concerts. And then 4th of July picnics, the mill was responsible for. Now, Ms. Meadows had a newspaper article that said, July uh, 4th picnic of 1922 drew 1,500 to 2,000 people because, well, they had a chicken supper, but perhaps that wasn't the draw. But the next thing they had was a fire truck display and the trucks were new. And they also had a radio demonstration, same reason. This was a new technology. Hey, let's, let's see what the radio can do for us. What entertainment can it provide for us? And they also had a bowl game that was scheduled for a newly flattened field. So that was a, a good thing to have, a newly flattened field. The Oakland band played, and then there was a fireworks display. See, bowl you're game chicken. Um, Church activities were that. also an entertainment. Suppers, tent meetings, Sunday school children entertainment, softball games across the street from the Oakland church and church picnics. And this was a real big deal. The, there was a ticket and that of course had four corners and the children could use those four corners for free of course, it was paid for by their parents, but they knew that they could go and get ice cream four times if they wanted it. Everybody loved that idea. And then 1931 hit, the Legislative Act of the Patapsco Water Basin was signed by Government Albert Ritchie. I believe that I meant to say Governor <laughs> Albert Ritchie. They said that, um, that they were going to convert the north branch of the Patapsico River into a reservoir for Baltimore City residents. The law gave the city the right to remove mills, factories, workshops, farms, churches, graveyards, schools, houses, outhouses, or anything that hindered the updating to the Baltimore City water system. 1933, about a year, two years later, rumors started. Hmm, I think we're gonna get a reservoir here. No, won't happen here. Every, just about every lady said that to me. Nope, not gonna happen. 1942, this is 11 years later, an official announcement was finally made. <clears throat> that indeed, they were going to have a reservoir and they were going to lose their town. 1945, friendly and helpful, the president of the company, John Graham Melville. He died at the age of 57. It was said that the death of his son in 1944 in World War II and the idea that the mill was going to be lost to him forever was looming over his head and it hastened his early death. And 1946, the Melvilles added a die, a die house for $100,000. And they wanted to prove that they were a going concern. They had their reputation to think about and their livelihood for as long as it might take for a reservoir to be built. 1947, five years after the announcement, 
the timber cutters began to arrive. They came from the Carolinas, they came from Tennessee, they came from Virginia and West Virginia, a hundred at a time. They lived in houses that were vacated by the mill people <clears throat> or by the farmers. They liked the area so much that they built homes, they brought their families. There was one place, Deer Park and Lyons Mill area, uh, which is in Baltimore County today, that was called Little Virginia because so many people had moved there. In 1951, construction on the dam began. The mill finally closed its doors for keeps. 60 homes were destroyed. The last people left. Yeah, they were holdouts, but people did not want to leave. And only a night watchman was left. In 1953, Tom and George went to court. They wanted to high buyout by showing that they were a going concern. They had the mill appraised, the woolen mill appraised at $3 million. So it was not a tiny operation by any means. They asked $2 million. They got $1.5 million plus $90,000 for the adjoining parcels and for the dye house they had put in. So altogether it was $1,590,000. Not too bad. This was the day of the auction. It was October 1st, 1953. Just about everything of any value at all was put up for auction. One thing that surprised me was 500 chairs were taken out. I suppose that the majority of them came from that community center, but my goodness, that was a lot of chairs. Uh, file cabinets, uh, sinks from the store, there were the cash register, scales, the coke cooler, display counters from the houses, there were the uh, windows, they took the windows out, the doors out, the woodwork from the interior, the woodwork from around the windows. Um, just about everything you can think of, including, of course, the mill equipment, uh, the looms. The scope of the project of this dam was just enormous. 9,200 acres in Carroll County were taken and 3,500 acres were acquired from Baltimore County. The gorges of the Patapsico were so steep that tractors were lowered on a 50, 250 foot line in order for them to have timber that had been cut by the timber cutters to hoist those, that, that timber up on the same lines to trucks that were waiting for them at the top. Another monumental task was building a 17 mile tunnel, 350 foot beneath the ground to gravity feed water to Lake Montebello, a filtration plant in Baltimore. The company that got the bid was um, the Arundel Company. They were going to be able to build it. Uh, oddly enough, Mrs. O'Donnell, one of the ladies that I talked to, uh, her husband uh, worked for the Arundel Company. And when they started dynamiting, uh, the, the workers came and got her from her house and took her away from the noise. It was part of her farm was, was going to be used. Uh, her house was spared, but not much of her acreage was gone. <clears throat> Once the trees were taken down and removed, they began dynamiting the rocky hillsides and the houses and the mill as well. This came from the brown section of the sun paper. And you will see that little boys uh, on the walkway or the little bridge that went across. I think that was the bridge that we saw that went across to the outhouses. And here we see the war-torn Oakland mill. It's on its way 
to its final extinction. The entire landscape is just truly war-torn. Uh, you see the North Branch running by, heading out towards Liberty Road. But they couldn't impound the water for the dam until the roads were relocated, until power lines were reloaded, were rerouted, and bridges were built. And so what you see here in the upper picture is the uh, bridge over the North Branch, the, the biggest bridge. And you can see houses in the distance. I, was understood, I understood that this house was owned by a family called Scott. How about that? And here's another little house and another house. Um, here's something that looks like a barn to me. All these places were, were taken down um, for the water to uh, consume. This little bridge is over Snowden's Run, the smaller of the tributaries. So this was the bridge there. They also had uh, Morgan Run and Ivy Mill bridges to do. The dam was completed in 1953. It took three years. It was 155,000 cubic yards of concrete, a lot of concrete, 160 foot high, and they had a 489 foot spillway. Take a look at this. This is how the dam, now it's getting closer to the top. Now it's all the way to the top. And here it goes over the spillway, the 489 foot spillway. And this was a compliment of, once again, of Mrs. Meadows, uh, who for, she was a historian at heart and took all these pictures. It was just amazing that she knew what to take a picture of. Oh, once all the water was impounded, it was 43 billion gallons of water. And it was this, the combined storage capacity of both Pretty Boy and Lock Raven dams. This is a picture from 1954, dedicated by Baltimore's mayor, Tom D'Alessandro Jr. And in the distance, You can see this is the North Branch Bridge going across uh, um, Liberty Road, going across Snowden's Run. There's the second bridge. And here, here is Oakland Mills Road. And this was down to, as far as down to the mill. This of course is the actual dam. In 1971, when we were living there, this water treatment, built, <clears throat> treatment plant was built for Carroll residents in the Freedom District. <clears throat> now, if you take a ride down the, today, down the end of the road and stop at this plant and look through those trees, you will see about five floats, well, more than that, float, red floats, easy to see. And I was told that at, underneath of those floats were the foundation stones for the mill. And also do some bass fishermen who said the same thing, that the fish were really abundant in this area. So they figured that they were around the foundation stones. In 2009, a second plant, which doubled the output of the, uh, from three to seven million gallons of water was built. Um, this is kind of, I, this was a sad picture to me, but I used it for the cover of the book. Uh, Baltimore City <clears throat> took the mill worker source of employment. It took their homes, it took their neighborhoods, and it just took their way of life. They had to use their life savings to purchase land and build homes. 
Others lived with relatives and some only lived with the relatives for a short time. A lot of the men found work at other mills, Rockland at uh, Falls Road, Dickieville in the Woodlawn area, Oella in Ellicott City, Ashland in Timonium. And the ladies also had to find new sources of employment. One lady went and worked in the office of Montgomery Ward. Uh, two of them, Miss O'Donnell being one of them, uh, became school teachers. And two more ladies found jobs at the Hustler's Tea Room in downtown Baltimore. Transition to a new life was difficult. Some people were just overwhelmed with grief and shock. I became very depressed. At least one person is thought to have committed suicide. Even Tom Melville said he never wanted anything again. He never wanted to own anything again. He, his livelihood was gone and his position in the community were taken from him. The farmers were devastated as their properties were condemned. Land and houses that had been in their families for generations were taken from them and destroyed. The difference was that the farmers received a sum of money for their land where the mill folk who rented were left without funds and were homeless. Sometimes progress makes us sad as we watch the old and the familiar turn into the new and strange sights. But we get over it. However, I feel sure that the loss of an entire way of life remained in the minds of the mill owners and the Oakland people for the rest of their lives. I hope you enjoyed this bit of Carroll County history. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. That was an outstanding uh, overview and very, very interesting talk about, uh, quote, progress in Carroll County and uh, the area around there, uh, Oakland Mill. Um, now it's an opportunity for people to unmute and ask Diana any questions you would like. Uh, please uh, feel free to ask any questions. Also, you can use the chat and we will monitor that and give the questions to Diana. So uh, we welcome your questions now. Hey, Diana, this is Frank Padovic. How are you? Hi. Uh, I, the, the, when they put the flint in those bales of cotton that they sent, that was pure sabotage, right? They knew what they were doing? I'm sorry, can we turn this up? Any yes, it's up all the That's way. He asked about putting the flint in the bales. That was sabotage. Okay, yes. What about that? Yeah, that, that, was that was pure sabotage. sabotage on the part of the Confederacy. Uh, whether it was the, yes, it was the Southerners who were providing the cotton to run this cotton mill. Uh, and they did put flint in these bales that they were sending north uh, to this particular mill. And when they got it off the train, brought it there, when the machinery met contact, uh, it started that first fire. That was 1864. But did they do it to sabotage the factory or why did they put the flint in there? Good question. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> um, I, I would think that anything that they could do to disrupt yeah. uh, the progress of the war, but that this is one of the things that they did. Right, that'd be my guess too. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Chris, you had a question? Kristen? Yes, I was, I was just going to ask, was there any concern about uh, the environment by changing things up so much by adding a dam? Did they think they were doing something good for fishing or did they think they were doing something bad for flooding out so much habitat or was it just not considered? I don't believe it was considered. Um, certainly the people in the Eldersburg area were happy with the dam, not the people who in the Oakland area, but those in the Eldersburg, they enjoy the idea that they would have a place to fish, place to put boats, uh, recreation, you could walk around the edge of the water. Um, 
I do not think that they gave too much thought to what was going to happen. Uh, was, was the water pure for the uh, Baltimore City residents? Who knows what they th really thought? I do not know. Do we have any other questions for Diana? Well, is that the Blueberry Hill, Diana, that the song is written about? Yes, that was, uh, wow. what was his name? Toby Yeah. Was it Chubby Checker? Yep. No, Fats Domino. Fats Domino. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was during that time period. And I think it's it's kind of amazing that I ended up living on the same road <laughs> where I went to Nick. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, it was it was a nice thing to do to walk up. I have uh there was a reservoir that was built on top of the hill where Tom lived. And it was put up there by Mr. Steele when he was building the new mill. And this was to keep water always handy uh, to put out future fires if there were any, by luck, there never was another fire. Uh, there was a sad thing that happened with that reservoir. Like I said, it was Tom was on, had his home on top of the hill and he had a two-year-old son and they, he was playing ball with his cousin and the ball went down and plopped into the reservoir. He ran after it, bent over to get it, fell in, and he drowned. So that was a very sad time for uh, Mr. Melville, the third one. Any other questions? Diana, this is Sam Brainerd. Was there any, is there any trace of that smaller reservoir now on the top of the hill? Um, I, I don't think so. I say that because I have um, on my bookcases at home, a very heavy uh, pedestal, the top portion of it that I think came from that, but I wasn't positive when I picked it up when I was up there back in the 60s and 70s looking around. Uh, today, there is the second uh, filtration plant up there. So I have no idea what's left and they have it blocked off so that you can't go up to see it. And uh, in the old days, we would go down to the end of Oakland Road and uh, walk out to the uh, water at water's edge. And I saw road, it was part of Oakland Road uh, that was upended. You had pipes coming out of the hillsides. You had uh, rocks and concrete uh, foundation visible from the left-hand side in the water. Uh, of course, this was when it was low, uh, what am I trying to say? When it was, when we did not have uh, any rain for a long time, so we could see what was there. Yeah, thank you. I, I was looking on Google Maps, uh, and I couldn't see any trace of where the reservoir might be, but uh, thanks. I am. Oh, it was, it was more like a giant swimming pool. I have the feeling that's what the women were talking about. It was difficult because I never did see it myself. Uh, but there was a fence that was put around it too late. And that's why I think I might have that pedestal, that, that top piece. I have a question. Yeah. Did you know, I was curious, it'd be interesting to delve into the archives at the Baltimore County Historical Society or Baltimore City Archives. And I was just wondering if um, you ever stumbled across any sort of political um, articles or something from, you know, that side of things of people saying, oh, well, we have to do this. It's the only option we have for our growth. I was just curious about kind of the, the politics side of things. And then I was um, I've been asked to introduce Frank soon uh, for a special presentation. Thanks. You want, um, uh, there was no, as far as the ladies were concerned and the newspaper articles that I picked up to read, there was nothing, I mean, it was all rumors. 
these people just lived on these rumors. No, I don't think that's going to happen. You know, our farms will be safe. Our uh, town is going to be safe. We don't think it's going to happen. Never, never happen. And of course it did. Um, afterward, there were some newspaper articles that talked about uh, what had happened when the uh, timber cutters came uh, and how they had lived in the various houses that had been vacated. And matter of fact, Freedom Elementary School uh, was said to have been built because of this influx of people from the South moving into uh, what was then Carroll County. Um, I Thank you. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Yeah. Well, if, if we don't have any other questions, I, I would like to um, give um, Diana a, a virtual round of applause for, for a great presentation. <laughs> Thank and, you, thank you. <laughs> and I believe we're handing uh, the, <laughs> I think we're handing the mic over to, to Frank Badovic, who is going to um, offer some, some thoughts. Okay, Frank. <laughs> Thanks, nice job, Diana, very, very enjoyable. Thank you. Um, anyone who's visited the Society's campus in the last year can't help but notice all the improvements. The exteriors of Kimmy's and Cocky's received a fresh coat of paint, uh, the ceilings in Kimmy have been patched to fix holes left over from when we re, uh, redid the electrical uh, system in that building. And the ceilings and walls have received a fresh coat of paint. Volunteers also conducted a spring cleanup of the Kimmy basement, our gardens and grounds. The result, the campus looks great. It really does. And all because of Chris McMasters. And though you may not know it, this was paid for out of her own pocket. She also handled some maintenance issues, both inside and on the roof, bravely continuing our valiant battles against the local squirrel population. But more importantly, Chris epitomized the dynamic duo of Batman and Robin in her own singular self, minus the capes, of course. With the departure of Steve Jakovich, we lacked an executive director. Chris, who was already serving as board chair, selflessly offered to fill in as the ED until we could find someone else for the position. Most importantly, she insisted that she not be paid, suggesting that our books would look a lot better for the new guy if she didn't take a salary. And so that's what happened. She served in this one of a kind hybrid position for more than a year, never complaining because of her devotion to the society. What's more, she did it with uh, during the troubling time of COVID a time when we seem to put more alcohol on our hands than our, in our mouth. Chris navigated society through the pandemic sea around the shoals of quarantine, distancing, and mask mandates. When member and community outreach became impossible, she said, no problem, and responded by aggressively increasing our presence on social media. She started a YouTube channel and encouraged local history Facebook postings and homegrown videos. The public's response was enthusiastic. Facebook photos and descriptions of historic sites drew thousands of hits, and a few video postings easily topped 1,000 viewers within weeks. Chris even hosted two videos herself, and she was a natural at that. During her term, Chris helped organize her annual fund and legacy gala sponsorship campaigns and appeared in the virtual gala telecast. She worked on the Bluegrass, Bourbon, and Bocce event, helped with grant proposals, and administers those grants we had received from the Maryland Historical Society, the Maryland Historic Trust, and the Community Investment Tax Credit Program. She almost single-handedly created a partnership with Shepherd's staff for the 2021 Houses of Worship Tour, and is organizing the upcoming 2022 Westminster Christmas Home Tour. She also arranged for much needed improvements to the society's software, hardware, and internet access, all the while she carefully tracked expenditures and was always on the lookout for possible sponsors and contributors. She served as an active member of the county's Celebrating America Committee and always looked for opportunities to promote the society. She developed partnerships with historical societies in Pennsylvania to create a week of virtual events that focused on 
railroad history. And she used her own connections with church groups and the DAR to encourage them to become HSCC partners. She actively participated in the programming committee meetings, made many suggestions for events, introduced speakers, made announcements at all box lunch talks, and even helped present one of her own with Kathy Beatty on 19th century funeral practices. Perhaps most importantly, Chris enthusiastically did what she asked others to do. She participated. She donated for a room naming opportunity in Cockies in honor of her departed husband. She gave to the Community Investment Tax Credit Fund and the annual fund. She bid in the gala auction. It's obvious how much she loves the society. She's a real problem solver and proactive leader and didn't allow barriers to stop her in doing what she thought was best for the society. Most importantly, she held us all together through COVID and kept us moving in a forward direction when there's a real danger of us stagnating. Chris, we're all grateful for your service and dedication to the society. On behalf of the board, I offer my sincere thanks and my hearty applause. Oh, well, thank you so much. My goodness, I really appreciate it, Frank. Wow, I, I, I listened to that and I think really I'd like to get to know that person. <laughs> 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 Somebody's been reading the reports I sent through. That's terrific. I, I really <laughs> thank you all. I have to say it's been a real joy for me. Um, there's a side that maybe it's harder to see and that is that, you know, during COVID, um, it's been awful quiet in, in Westminster and in a house where I just have my kitty cats who are making me crazy half the time. It was wonderful to be able to escape to the historical society and really work on problems and issues that, you know, might make a difference in the long run. So in a way, the historical society was sort of my my bridge to staying kind of sane and normal with the community. I'm a, I'm a person who loves to be with people. And so it gave me some place to go and some place to do. And so for me, it was a great, great joy. And I wanna thank you all for um, allowing me to grow and stretch and for um, being behind me whenever I had some crazy or off the wall idea I wanted to try. And for um, our society being very, very plucky because we really were willing to give it a go. And I appreciate that openness from all of our board members and from our members who understood that this was not the best time for us, but we were gonna do the best we could. So thank you, thank you. You're most welcome. Uh, and now I think it's time for uh, us to have the drawing for the cake from Starry Night Bakery. Am I right, Lynn? <laughs> yes, you're right. Sorry, Frank. Uh, Chris, uh, first of all, if anyone else has any <laughs> greetings to bring, forgive the dog, uh, to Chris, please uh, feel free to unmute. Uh, and then we have a minute or two for that. Uh, Charlie, I think you'd like to say a few words. And then um, we can go right to Chris, who will do the drawing before we leave. So I'm going to turn it over to Charlie. And uh, okay. anyone else who would like to unmute and bring uh, thanks to Chris, please feel free to do so. And thank you, Frank, for a wonderful summary of the tremendous work that Chris has done for the society. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lynn. Uh, this is Charlie Fisher, and uh, I'm speaking as the vice chair of the board. And I wanna second everything that, that uh, Frank Badovic has said about you, Chris. And uh, I think I mentioned to, to you at one time in the past that uh, on behalf of the board, I felt like you, you had been a gift from God to the historical society uh, just when we needed you to step in and uh, exercise all the talents that you had. And uh, we'll be forever grateful. And we want you to continue, of course, your, our immediate past uh, chair and a member of the executive committee. And I think some of us have some other ideas of things that you might uh, do well for us, but thank you very much. I uh, second everything that uh, Frank said. Thank you so much, Charlie. I, I so appreciate it. And, and, you know, having Jason around has been such a joy oh. for me to know 
things are going in the right direction. Sorry, guys. Okay, Chris, we're turning it over to you. You must mean Christina because I don't have the um, the list of names to pull from. And Christina, it looks like you need to unmute. I have the I have the list here in the box. <clears throat> Says Doug Milkey. is the winner <laughs> so i don't know if he's in here or not okay doug so you can uh, stop by the historical society and pick up your gift certificate to story night bakery uh which is good for an eight inch cake that can have the filling of your choice and be decorated personalized for you that's it yeah i'm just gonna get to pick it up well, thank you, everyone. And please feel free to unmute if you would like and uh, say a few words before I close down. We have a few minutes. So if you'd like to, again, share any words with Chris or Frank or Jason or anyone else, you're welcome to do so. And thank you very, very much for joining us for this uh, excellent program. And Diana, thank you again for a superb, superb talk. Appreciate I'd it. Like, I'd like to say two things or three things really. I'd like to thank everyone again for being here. And I would like to say that um, I, I, I wanna thank again, Chris and the um, e executive committee and the search committee uh, for making the shift here to the historical society pretty seamless. I mean, I've been in the situation where you're trying to find the right person and go through all those motions and the handoff was, was spectacular. And so, uh, I just want to express that uh, to, to the whole society team that um, I'm really grateful for how that went and, and, and also to Chris too. The other thing that um, Dr. Leitner wanted me to mention to everyone is we have Diana's book for sale um, at the store here on Main Street in Westminster, but we also have it available online. So if you're interested in getting your copy of The Forgotten Corner, you can go to the society's website, hit the shop tab, and it's fairly simple to find and order that if you'd like to see and uh, receive a copy of that book. So thank you again. All right, well, thank you everyone. And we really appreciate your coming in today. Good luck in the snow tomorrow. And we hope you will be joining us for future events.